cast all my cares on you. And I lay all my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I cast all my cares on you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, we'd like to welcome those of you who've joined us today. Uh, I thought this is Father's Day. And uh, I thought I'd read you a little something about influence. The story was written to dad and his boy every Sunday afternoon. A pastor and his 11-year-old son would go out into the town and hand out gospel tracts. That day it was very cold outside, pouring down rain, and the pastor's son put on his warmest clothing and said, Dad, I'm ready. And his pastor dad said, ready for what? Well, Dad, it's time to hand out tracts, he said. Dad said, son, it's very cold outside, it's pouring rain. The boy gave his dad a surprised look and said, but Dad, aren't people still going to hell even though it's raining? To which his dad answered, son, I'm not going out in this weather. Despondently, the boy said, Dad, can I go, please? And his father hesitated for a moment and said, son, you can go. Here's some tracks. Be careful. Thanks, Dad. I'll see you later. With that, he was off into the rain. He went door to door, handing out tracks to everybody he met on the street. The rain was bone chilling. He was down to his very last track. And he stopped on a corner, looked for someone to hand a track to, but the streets were totally deserted. And he turned toward his first, the first home he saw. Started up the sidewalk, the front door, rang the doorbell. He rang the bell and nobody answered. He rang it again, but still no one answered. He waited, but still no answer. And finally, this lad on a mission turned to leave, but something stopped him. And again, he turned to the door. And he rang the bell and he knocked loudly on the door with his fist. And he waited, something holding him there on that front porch. Then he rang the doorbell again. And this time, the door slowly opened. And standing in the doorway was a very sad elderly lady. <coughs> She softly asked, what can I do for you, son? And with radiant eyes and a smile that lit up the world, the little guy said, ma'am, I'm sorry if I disturbed you, but I just wanted to tell you, Jesus loves you. He really does love you. And I came to give you this, my very last good news track, which will tell you all about Jesus and his great love. And with that, he handed out his last track and turned to leave, and she called to him as he departed, thank you, son. And may God bless you too. Well, that next Sunday he rolled around. And his dad was in the pulpit as the service began. And he said, does anyone have a testimony or want to share anything? And slowly, way in the back, an elderly lady stood to her feet. She said, no one, no one in this church knows me. I've never been here before. You see, before last Sunday, I was not a Christian. My husband passed away some time ago, leaving me totally alone in the world, and I planned on living my life. I took a rope and a chair in the attic. I stood on the chair and put the rope around my neck. And I was about to jump off when a loud ringing of my doorbell startled me. And I thought, I'll, I'll wait a minute, whoever it is will go away. And I waited and I waited, but the doorbell kept ringing. And it seemed to get louder and more insistent. And then the person rang and also started knocking loudly. And I thought to myself, who on earth could that be? Nobody ever rings my bell or comes to see me. I loosened a rope from my neck and got off the chair and started downstairs to the door. All the while, the bell rang louder and louder. And when I opened the door, I looked and I could hardly believe my eyes. But there in front of me on my porch was the most radiant and angelic little boy I'd ever seen in my life. And he spoke with cheer of light voice, ma'am, I just came to tell you, Jesus really does love you. And then disappeared back into the cold and rain. And I closed the door and I read every word of that gospel track. Well, I've come here personally to say thank you to God's little angel who came just in the nick of time. By doing so, spared my soul from eternity in hell. There was not a dry eye in the church. 
and shouts of praise and honor to Christ the King were sounded from the very rafters of the building. And so the question is today, who have you told? Use every opportunity because you never know who needs to hear the message. Amen. Wow. That's powerful. See, the Bible didn't say go into all the world Sunday school teachers. Go into all the world, world preachers. It said, you go. Amen. Every one of us has to tell the story. Amen. If you don't have a gospel track, tell your story. Tell it simple. How you were lost and undone and Jesus saved your soul. Then quote a scripture. That's why we have this word. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, something to start off on in this Father's Day. I thought about this because you see, the father had planted importance of witnessing to an 11-year-old child who followed his father, even when his father didn't go that day. Cold. I don't know about you, but sometimes those cold, damp days, your hands hurt, your bones hurt, and dad stayed home, and the passion he gave to his son caused him to go out. That's powerful. That's powerful, y'all. Well, we're, we're going to look at the word of the Lord this morning, but this is my Bible right here. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. This is my one. I like, I love this part. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. I took this in. I will hear. I will hear. And listen. And listen. And obey. and obey. Now boldly I confess, boldly I confess. My mind is alert. Aren't you glad you woke up there? Alert. In that alert mind. My heart's receptive. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible. I'm about to receive the incorruptible. The indestructible. The indestructible. The indescribable. The indescribable. The ever living seed of the word of the Lord. The ever living seed of the word of the Lord. And I will never be the same. I will never be the same. You know what we need today? What's wrong with our society? We need more men who are fathers in the home. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk about Moses a little bit this morning. Probably we need more dads like Moses' dad. Y'all remember his name? We'll talk about it in a minute. Moses' daddy. Aren't you glad Moses had a daddy and a mom who were there when he needed them most? Now, we'll get into the story of why Moses needed his parents. There's a passage from Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read a few verses, but we're going to have a lot of other scripture in here too that I'm not going to, that I'm not going to read right now. But here's what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 to 27 and it's talking about, chapter 11 talks about the chat, but the, this, this nature of faith, what faith is. Down to verse 23, the Bible says, By faith Moses, comma, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. Remember his command was, kill all boy babies. The Hebrew had to do that. That's what they were supposed to do, the Jews. Then it says, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the passing of pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he, was looked, for he looked to the reward. Then it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, Pharaoh, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And I, I, I had this thought because you see, the writer of the Hebrews ties in. They was looking to his reward, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches. Are you picking that up? So, so I was thinking, there's a lot of things that happen to us. i got a friend, Terry Padilla. I've got several others that one of their joys is to bring up these silly comments about what the husbands are thinking to the wife, right? 
And men always don't say this, but a lot of times they mean it like, here's one. When a man says it takes too long to explain, what it really means is I have no idea how it works. Right? When a man says to his wife, honey, take a break. You're worrying, you're working too hard. What he's saying is, I can't hear the game. <laughs> some, of these, some of these are dangerous. When a man says, that's interesting to my friend Brian Smith, who's one of the teens in our church, posts some of these. Here's one. When a man says, that's interesting, dear, what he means is, are you still talking? If he says, can I help with dinner, what he means is, why isn't dinner ready yet? <coughs> when he says... Don't fuss. I just cut myself. It's no big deal. What he means is, I probably have severed a limb off, but I'll bleed to death before I admit that it hurts so much, and, 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 and I'll, I'll try to get over it, so you don't need to help me. But I do need your help. By the way, if you're married to an RN, they just say, go to the doctor. <laughs> and when a man says, I can't find it, he doesn't mean... I really can't find What he means is it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I'm completely helpless and clueless. How about, I like this one. This is good, okay, guys? When a man says, I heard you, what he means is, I haven't the foggiest clue what you just said. I'm hoping desperately that I can fake it well enough that you're not going to spend the next three days yelling at me and explaining to me what you meant. Are you, I, you women are taking notes, aren't you? I can see that right now. Here's another one. A man says, you look terrific. He means, please don't try on one more outfit. I'm starving. We need to go eat something instead of shopping. How about this one? And this is the favorite one of mine because us guys, we love GPS. And we have a great sense of direction. And we always know where we're going. So if he says... I'm not lost. I know exactly where we are. What he means is, no one will ever see us alive again. <laughs> and if a man says to you, when you invite him to go shopping, I don't think I can go today. He means shopping is not a sport. And I'm never going to see it that way. I mean, some women think that's a sport. I just love to go shopping. And they'll leave early in the morning. And they'll shop all day and go back to the first store and the first thing they try it on, they'll buy. If a man says, I don't remember saying that, <laughs> it's because anything I may have said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. In fact, all past comments are null and void after seven days. Write that down, ladies. <laughs> And when a man says, it's not what I meant, what he means is, if something can be said and interpreted two ways, the one way that makes you sad or angry, I meant the other. So there's just a few little clues. I, I read this story about this, this husband, and he was in the bedroom, standing over their newborn baby's crib. Silently she watched him as he stood there, looking down on the sleeping infant. She saw in his face a mixture of emotion, disbelief, and doubt, and delight, and amazement, and enchantment, a little skepticism, and he'd stand back, and he'd shake his head, and he'd go, amazing, while smiling near the ear. And she was touched by his unusual display of deep emotion. And it, 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 it caught her attention, her eyes started glistening, as she slipped her arm around him and said, honey, a penny for your thoughts. He said, isn't it amazing when you take the time to really look close at how anyone could take and make a crib like this one for only $45.99? All right, so much, so much for the frivolity, but I just thought I'd throw that in because us fathers sometimes needs a little humor. So, so David, King David on his deathbed, spoke to his son Solomon. It's 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. Here's what he said. And you, my son Solomon, 
acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind for the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. Are you getting this? Mm -hmm. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Amen. So dads, our greatest privilege, uh, uh, your greatest opportunity, your greatest joy, our greatest responsibility is to be a parent. It's sometimes overwhelming. And when, when, the, thought, when the thought of getting married and marrying Judy and taking on that responsibility, I honestly didn't know if I could do it or not. I didn't. I'm sitting there, I'm kneeling there at the altar. Dr. Carl Summers was a pastor who performed our wedding ceremony. I'm kneeling there at the altar thinking, ah, I don't know if I can do this or not. And by the way, it was almost too late to get up and walk away. Not that I was tempted. But I was pretty shook up. And, 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 and we got married, left Oklahoma, moved to Georgia. That's where my job took me for about three months. And then we moved to Colorado Springs. And our story began in 1971 with Christopher Michael Bittner, Wendy McKayla, and Kelly Micah. We called them the first edition. Now, Wendy, of course, was adopted. When we had Wendy and Chris, I said, two kids, that's a good number, don't you think? And Judy said, I've only had one. Oh, so guess who came? Kelly. And he's been a splash of light ever since. What a great, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that she taught me into that. But then as we moved to Missouri, and we had a lot of foster children. We started in 1975. But, but in Missouri, Cherie, Kristen, Benjamin, JC, Michael, William, and Skyler and Isaiah joined our clan. So there's 10 total. Somebody said, didn't you know 10 kids? You do what you do because God called you to do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. By the way, you know this already, but, but things don't always unfold like you wish they could have. All your children should be following Jesus, Mike. I'm a pastor. I watch pastors. Some of these pastors, their kids are saints. And they're following their daddy's footsteps. And they're going to be pastors and blah, blah, blah. You know? And I'm sitting there going, all my kids are doing something different. Is that all right? Yes. Do we have to look at other people to have the gold standard of being successful as a father? No. Sometimes it's just serving God and trusting Him because the, it's not over till it's over. Does that make sense? Amen. So, so, so what, what, what I got out of this early story was that I, I was gaining in this almost fear and trepidation the glimpse of how important fatherhood was then and how important it has been for the last 53 years. Been married 50 some years. 53 years. And fatherhood, the importance and the value and the sacredness of it never changes, folks. The psalmist writes in 112 Psalm, verses 1 and 2, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Don't you like that? Amen. The most influential, the most important job on earth. And I was thinking about this the other day because, you know, our society has, has they poo-poo the idea of mothers being in the home. They, they make fun of the mothers who feel like that's one of the most, I want you to understand this. Fatherhood and motherhood are the most important jobs in the world. And when God created us and told us to procreate, he gave us the responsibility to take on that task seriously. Moses' dad and mom took that seriously. We take it seriously. If ever the, there was a, a, a move to, to, to destroy family, I want you to think about this. Our families are not the same today as they were 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And our society, and probably part of our government has something in this, but has taken and pushed the husband out and, and, our, and makes men look stupid. Excuse me. Men are leaders of the home. That's what the Bible says we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the spiritual leaders. The women set the foundation. It's a team effort, folks. It can't be done by one. Amen? Amen. Amen. Got to have it. Someone said a boy loves his mother, but will follow his father. And by the way, even if my dad's not alive, 
a lot of what I do. I'd like to hear him say, Dad, I'm, son, I'm proud of you. And I was thinking, one day, my dad didn't say I love you a lot. And part of his growing up, if I take care of you, provide for you, I love you. If I am here with you, I love you. But one day we were leaving for college. And, and my buddy was driving the car that day. And, and we had loaded up all the suitcases and everything in the car, 57 Plymouth. And my dad's standing out there and he put his arm around me and says, I want you to know I love you and I'm proud of you. You know what? There were a lot of things in life that I've heard, but that was so important. Amen. Tell your kids. If you haven't got kids yet, when you have kids, tell your kids, remind them. I've watched, I've watched a lot of fathers. And, uh, that's one that's important. Four words. Little kids say quite often, I'm going to be like you, Dad. I'm going to be like you. Remember the song, the, the song Cast in the Cradle? I'll be just like you, Dad. I'm going to be just like you. And the story of that song, the father was busy doing all the important stuff, making a living, doing all this stuff. Hey, Dad, would you throw the ball to me? Well, I want to get some time. And little boy, go away. But go, I'm going to be like you, Dad. I'm going to be like you. Over and over again. And I just want you to understand that, that there are some things, I, I want our kids to be successful. There are some things where you look at and you value your, your success rating, and the world doesn't judge you on the same level that God does. So when you're setting your, your, your goals, set your goal to be the father that God would be pleased that you're doing the job that you're doing, right? So in Hebrews chapter 23, or chapter 11, verse 23 here, it's interesting because the Bible says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him. And I don't know if you know about this. By the way, uh, Moses' daddy's name was a Amram. A-M-R-A-M, -M, okay? And his, his, his wife, Moses' mom's name was Jochebed. Now, I want you to understand this. That, that if you remember the story, if you look at this story, Moses, all the male babies were to be killed because the Egyptians didn't want any more children. And he wanted to cut down the population growth of the Jews. And so Moses' mom and dad looked at this child and said, we cannot, nor will we. So the Bible says she made a basket, covered it in pitch tar, and placed this child where Pharaoh's daughter would be bathing. And Miriam, the older sister who ended up with helping Moses, was there, planted there intentionally. The plan was a good plan. Pharaoh's daughter finds the baby. Oh, look, a baby. Oh, this is wonderful. What am I going to do with the baby? And so she realizes that she's not able to nurse and take care of this child. And there Miriam pops in. Hey, my mom. My mom could do that for you. And so we have the story taking a major change. Moses' life is saved because Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses and God calls him for a purpose later on. But right now he's just called out. And he's taken out of the water. And he's given to Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter can't take care of him right now. And guess what? Moses' mother and father get the responsibility then of having this child in their home. And I was thinking, how long would he be there? Because you see, now he's Pharaoh's grandson. Are you getting the picture? And it's not long after he's weaned, he's got to go live with Pharaoh's daughter as her son. Amen. So I did a little looking up yesterday. He was there too. He was going to be weaned. Now, in different Jewish culture, new birth up to three years of age sometimes. And I'm thinking, how many values can you get into a kid's head if he's three years old? But as I read on, I found out that some places it was five years of age. Okay, we're doing a little better, right? And once in a while, it was up to 13. Now, what we don't know is how long it was. But here's the thing. The Bible says that his folks refused to compromise and let this son be killed. That, that God gave them opportunity to raise him. And somewhere along the way, mom and dad instilled in this child 
the value system that caused him not to turn his back on the Hebrew people and got him in trouble because he tried to do it himself. But the bottom line is that we find him then in the desert walking around taking care of sheep after 40 years and God comes to him and says, okay, now it's time. I've chosen you. By faith, Moses' parents hid him. I just want you to understand this. Well, we forget this because sometimes we take the TV and we throw our kid in front of the TV, turn it on, and let them watch the, the whatever it is that's on there. Uh, maybe it's Walt Disney and all this other stuff. By the way, there's a lot of junk on uh, Walt Disney that's unbiblical and it's demonic, some of it. Keep your ears open, folks. A lot of stuff on TV stealing your kids' soul. Be careful with that. Early days count. So Aram and J Aram and J Jochebed raised this child, listen to me, who would change the world. Amen. Early days count. I'm going to say it again. Early days count. What you do with your children when they're babies are so important, folks. Amen. Early days count. It, it, it's, it's, it's those early days when you get a chance to instill in these children. So, so the Bible talks about Moses rejects the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the name sake of Christ. And I'm thinking, how did he meet Christ? Well, he met God right there at the burning bush for sure. So, so the first thing that's really important in the story is it's Father's Day. And I'm, I, I, and I, and I'm honoring the fathers. But I want you to get this, that without the mother and the father together in this story, we wouldn't have had a good outcome. So verse 23 just says, by faith... Moses' parents. Don't you like that? By faith. Mm -hmm. His parents. By faith, his parents. Amen. When he was born, hit him for three months. After three months, he was, so he was three months old when he said the basket, right? So Pharaoh's daughter gets him at three months of age. He's still nursing. He still needs the intimate care of a mother and father. So when Moses is placed in the bulrushes where the daughter bathed, I'm thinking, man, that was pretty grassy, wasn't it? When you think about it? You th there were crocodile out there. I don't know how God protected the child from that, but there were crocodiles and, and all this other stuff. And, and of course, I'm sure they had people, they probably had servants around Pharaoh's daughter. So if the crocodiles got in there, they would get the servants first before they got the duck. I'm just saying that's how they worked. That's how that society thought. But but uh, but we've got we've got big sister hanging out, offering Moses' mom to take care of him until it's time to move him to the palace. So they've got a little bit of time to instill this value, instill this value system in this child. And I want you to get it. They did it when he was young. They didn't wait till he was a teenager. They didn't wait till he was an adult person. Okay, you want to go to church or not? No, you instill it when they're a small child. That's when the value system takes place. The Catholic Church used to say, give us a child who is seven years of age and he'll be a Catholic for life. That's it. Now you're training. So where did Moses receive his training? At home. Amen. I just want you to get this. The church cannot build enough classrooms that will take the place of a godly dad and a godly mom. Mm -hmm. The family is the primary classroom where your children will learn about Jesus and about the value system. And it might be the grandparents even. But whatever it is, somebody in that family has got to do something to help your children get to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Church can't do it. Oh, look. So understand, the primary classroom, write this down, is the family home. Parents who are lucky and in, 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 in the kind of kids that they, they have a hunger for God, I think it's really important. But sometimes, in order to have the hunger for something, you've got to give them opportunity for it. By the way, how many of you uh, love spinach? We know Foy won't, but anyone else, because he's green. He had new green. But I love spinach. I love canned spinach. Bye bye the sailor man. You know. <laughs> I love that. I love that cooked spinach. There are people who go, I, 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 I'd rather eat a can of, I, by myself, a can of, of Popeye spinach, any kind of spinach in a can, than the raw spinach that you find in a salad. 
Now that's just me. But but I, but I thought, you know, uh, how did I develop a taste for that? Because my mom probably said it to me, right? Of course, my mom always said, you better eat that because there's kids in China that are hungry. And I'm thinking, send it to them. <coughs> green beans. When I was a little bitty kid, I loved green beans. I mean, I loved them so bad that mom got the can out and didn't get it in a pot or in a kettle and put it on the stove, I had it gone. The time I was five years old, if I saw green beans, I'd vomit it almost. It was, it was really bad. I got really, and it wasn't until I was married and I was in my 20s and Judy started cooking green bean casserole with uh, mushroom stuff and the onions on top. Then I started eating green beans again. Because whenever I thought of green beans, I almost did, you know. And, and, so, and the, so, so understand, it's, it's that we teach our kids. Give them a hunger. Give them a reason. Making church a joyful place. Sometimes I think we overdo it with, with playtime in church. Is it okay to say that? I like children's church. But sometimes children's church is entertainment time versus a spiritual journey time. But you still, you're not going to get enough out of the church teaching unless the adults have taken it on to bring it home. Amen? Amen. So that's important. So Moses had a mom and a dad whose faith was engaged long before Moses could even say a word. I like that. And, and, and so don't overestimate the importance. Dads are the spiritual leaders of the home. When Moses became of age in, 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 in chapter 12, verse 24, the Bible says, when he comes to years, Moses refused to align himself with Pharaoh because he knew his heritage. You plant the heritage, you plant the value system in your children, and when they get older, the world cannot steal that from them. Hallelujah. Amen. Mom and dad's faith were transferred from Aram and Jochebed to their son Moses, and all of a sudden, and I want to tell you something, there was a day when I was talking to somebody, I was in college, and, and, and it had always been... This is what our church believes. This is what the church doesn't believe. And, and I learned all this stuff. And one day as I was discussing with this guy about salvation, it dawned on me, this is what I believe. It was my belief. What happened? I learned it from my parents, and it became my value system. And, it, and it, I obviously I adopted it, but it became mine. And when it was mine, I'm going, hey, this is mine. I'm born again. My name is written in the last book of life. I'm going to heaven. And i got a reason to tell the story. Tell the story. Amen. Tell the story. Amen. So, so that, that's, that's a part that's so important to understand. Moses refused to be stuck in the box with Pharaoh even though he lived there. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh -huh. So the Bible says that we're in the world, but don't become like the world. Amen? That we can have a value system that helps us to set ourselves apart from that which the world is trying to cram you into. Be your person filled with the presence of God. You've got to be born again. You've got to repent and flee from sin. Amen. 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 Cannot live in sin and go, I'm going to heaven. It's okay. God will look the other way. Because I read the Bible. Alright? So now we have Moses acting in his own faith. So men, your example will set the tone and tenor of your family's journey and their faith. Amen. 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 So if Jesus Christ doesn't occupy the place of first priority, I was thinking about this. There's a lot of people that go to church, but the bottom line is this. If Jesus is not your number one priority, your family will learn that real fast and follow suit. Amen. 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 And suddenly it will be a thing of convenience. And then pretty soon, we'll get too busy for Jesus altogether. Amen. The Bible just says this, Train up a child in the way when he's young, and what? When he's old, he will not depart. Now, i thought about this a lot. I can bring my kids to church. I can teach them the value system. But the truth is this, that as I've taught them these principles, and some of them, by the way, without even realizing, they accept and adopt. But the truth is, that unless they've asked God to forgive their sin and redeem them and save them from all the junk in their life, they're still going to be lost even though they know all the right stuff. Is that all right to say that? Yes, it is. The problem is this. I mean, I've talked to people who said, well, I can, always, I can hear my mom saying, you shouldn't do that. But I did it anyway. And the truth is, 
in our rebellion, we find ourselves like the rich, like the, uh, the, the, the rich kid who was second in family and the prodigal father went after him every day to look for him. He took all that he thought was his and squandered it. And one day woke up going, I got to go home if I can just be a slave. Jesus calls us, understand that. So he has to be number one priority in our life. And if it is, it's a good chance your children will follow suit on the journey you've made. So, so those of you who are dads, and some of you, your kids are already grown. But some of you out online there, you have kids at home. What do you want to remember, be remembered for? What do you want to be remembered for in your life? Your job? The money you made? The car you drove? The possessions you acquired? I was thinking the other day, I wonder, I wonder if my kids remember my great sermons. Then I thought, they won't remember my sermons. Sometimes I don't even remember my own. <laughs> Part of it is if, you, if, I, if I wrote every word down and read the, the manuscript, uh, then I could look back in my record in my computer and I could find out what I said. But you know what? I don't always follow the script totally. Is that all right? Yeah. But, but, but I, I thought, you know what? My family probably will remember more of the mistakes I've made, the blunders I've made, the shortcomings I have. But you know what I want most of all? Because I tell some really great jokes, too. But I, I want to be known as the man who followed his father, his spiritual Amen. father. I want to be known... As a, as, a, as a dad who feared God, I, I want to be known as a dad who walked in the ways of God. I want, to, I want people to know, like my father, my word is my bond. Secondly, a mom and dad, and I, and I got mom in there because, even though it's Father's Day, because it's a team effort. Mom and dad need to have a vision for their children. God, give us a picture of what you want us to do. What do you think this kid is going to do? By faith, Moses' parents hid him. For three months after he was born because they saw he was not an ordinary child. You know what? I don't think there are such things as ordinary children, is there? All of our children are special in the eyes of God. All of our children are called to do something in the eyes of God. <coughs> Number one, there are things that, 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 that make a difference. If you don't have a teacher or a coach, <coughs> you still can have an ordinary kid. Do you realize that? But somewhere along the way, our hope is that some of the values that we call important will be passed on to our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandchildren, and they'll carry the heritage along. I like that idea, don't you? And, and there are things that, that, that moms can see. There are things pastors can see in these families growing up. And, and, and sometimes teachers don't even have it all. Some of my teachers weren't too... Positive with me. Is that a good way to put it? Michael Dean never finishes. Why? Well, I, I had this thing now where if I got it, why would I want to keep doing it? I wanted something else. <laughs> Moms and dads have to have a vision of faith and, 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 and believe that we're raising the next Moses. Is that all right to say that? Mm -hmm. We're raising someone to make a difference. It might His name might not be Moses. But, but if we are raising children, God, help them to make a difference in this broken world. Help them to be light to a dark world. Help them to do something for, some, for you, Lord, that others will know their lives are different because these kids pass by. So Aram and Jochebed had a, had a faith vision for Moses. And when, when all the babies were to be killed, they refused, and God provided a way. I want you to understand this. When we stand firm in our beliefs, God will provide a way for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes, I was thinking, some of you came from families where you never experienced the love of a faithful father. I've known dozens. Many, as, as a foster parent, many children abuse his children. Maybe you were raised in a home where there was drunkenness or uncontrolled anger or abandonment or, or you lost your father to death or, or like a friend of mine, his dad left when he was six months. Maybe six years old. I don't know, six months, six years. Maybe you had fathers who, who had a horrible home. And I, I was thinking about this the other day. 
There, there, there are people, folks, who are meaner than junkyard dogs and rude and awful people. And, and I'm thinking, they're making people just like them, right? Amen? And the thought occurred to me, these people, because we're, listen, we're hard on those mean people and bad parents. We're hard on them. We are. We judge them. But the thought occurred to me that, that someone in their past broke them. And now they're breaking others. The difference between Jochebed and, and, and her husband is that they had a vision for their son. A vision. And because they had a vision, they refused to let the world or their past interfere. Aren't, aren't you glad? They, they refused to let, let anything like that happen. So, um, so the bottom line is they, they, they focused on what God would do with their son Moses. So, so it, it's important to understand this. You can't do anything about your ancestors. So say amen if you can, right? Amen. amen. Now all of us can find, we can look at some of our ancestors, our parents even, and they did, by, by today's standards, hey listen, by today's standards, nobody would get their fanny spanked. Nobody would have to go cut down their own switch to have their fanny spanked because we might hit them. That's such a crock anyway. I just want you to know that. I think it's crock. I think every kid ought to have a little, little come to Jesus moment or two. You disobey, there's judgment day. I think, there, I think we ought to understand. One of the great tragedies with the society today is that we've let the woke people shove us out of being parents. And we're stuck in a corner. And if you discipline your child, you might have somebody stick their nose in your face saying, don't you touch that child. Because they don't know the story. So when the baby, these male babies are being killed, these parents said, no way, we're not going to do this. If there's a way we can save him, we're going to save him. And God, by the way, God gave them the plan. God put the idea in either, either, either dad or mom, Aram or, or Jochebed's mind. Hey, if we put him over there where Pharaoh's daughter takes a bath, maybe we can save him. And when they did it, it was a maybe, folks. Maybe in faith. When you look in the eye, I want you to get this. When you look in the eyes of your child or your grandchild, you believe God on behalf of your child, that God can do something with this child. God, please use them. God, help them. Pray for them. Pray for your grandkids if you don't have children at home. Pray for them. Lord, somehow break through the barrier of what the world has put on my kids and my grandkids and help them to find you. Build a relationship. Especially if you haven't had a, a, a father who loved you. You can't do anything about your ancestors. I want you to get this. Carefully listen. You can't do anything about your ancestors, but you can do something about your descendants. Did you get that? You can't change your ancestors, but you can do something about your future and those who follow in your footsteps. I've heard people say, I give anything to my dad, but just put his arm around my neck and tell me one time that he loved me. Well, my dad told me that. And towards the last years of his life, every time I saw him, I love you. I love you. I'm proud of you. The deep, deepest need in our hearts is to have somebody affirm us. One of the reasons why there's so many gangs and all this other junk is because children need someone to put their arms around them and hold them and hug them and say, I love you. You have value. Amen. That's important. Lord Jesus. The deepest need. Every child of God has... I want you to get this, because I was thinking about this the other day, my friend who, whose dad left when he was six. The thought occurred to me that there's a passage that says in Galatians 4, 6, and 7, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, and the Spirit who calls out, I have a Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you're a son, God made you also an heir. This is God calling you his son. And if you're an orphan and you don't have a father on the earth, you have a heavenly father. And we pray. Jesus said, when the disciples said, how should we pray? They, he said, pray ye therefore in this, in this manner. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed and holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and those we trespass against. And lead us not in temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, forever, forever. Our Father. And so if you don't understand this, all of us, whether you had a good dad or bad dad, have a heavenly Father who knows your need and stands by you if you let Him. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank because you. you are sons. Because you are sons. And if you're a daughter, it applies to you too. Amen? Amen. Also, the third thing this morning, dads need a courageous faith. Aaron and Jochebed when you think about the story of Moses, they showed great faith and trust in God and great courage to do that. Which, there, I mean, there's a lot of other Jews there and they're letting their kids get dead. But they said, not our son. Not our son. We see something important here. And they took steps. And it was a step of faith that could have ended in failure, but at least they gave it their best shot. Amen? Yeah. When we understand, I want you to get this. You've got to understand that our battle is not with flesh and blood according to the Word of God. It should encourage you that a spiritual battle can be fought by God. And there are battles going on right now on your behalf. If you only knew it. We just can't see that. Men are in a battle zone. Our society would cancel men if they could. They would take the masculinity away. They would de-testosteronize us. <laughs> So understand this. The Bible says in the last days in 1 Timothy 3 1, know this in the last days, perilous times will come, shall come. In the days ahead, folks, we're looking at some rough days ahead. We're looking at rough days. Amen. If you pay any attention to the political venue we've got and, and, and the way our society is going and the way our nation is headed, unless God brings revival, America is doomed can't turn the borders open and let multitudes and millions come invading your country and you haven't even figured out who they are or what they're doing. God help us. We're in for some rough days. How are we going to get through this? God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Take my yoke upon you and learn me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's a hallelujah moment. Thank you. Lord. So our homes are being attacked. Pleasure mad world has taken over and we're chasing the, sens the sensuality. So, so, so it doesn't take much for our children to get, uh, get into pornography, to drugs, to alcohol. Abortion is easily done, and we don't tell our parents what's going on. Divorce is a commonplace. Homosexual lifestyle is an accepted way of life. And transgender agenda, the transgender agenda is slipped into our schools, and our children are getting sucked into this when they're in preteen ages and we are almost unable to do something about it. Teach the values before they get there. Amen. Amen. Man. Put the fear out of your life, folks. We have to say by faith, in these difficult and dangerous days, we will raise our children for Jesus no matter what. Write it down. Yeah. One man wrote, if he had to do it again, Here's what he said he would do. If I had to do it over again. There's a song like that. If I had to do it over again, I'd do it with you. One, I'd love my wife more in front of my kids. My children. I'd laugh with my children more at our mistakes and our joys. I'd listen more even to the youngest. We have a way of kind of ignoring the little kids, amen? Mm -hmm. Not on purpose, but... It's kind of like, don't, don't throw, you remember the old thing, don't throw out the baby with the bath water? Because the last one that got a bath, and then back in the old days, the man took the bath first, and then he worked down the line, and if they had a house full of kids, the baby was in that nasty water. <laughs> don't forget our kids. Don't forget the value of them. I'd be more honest about my own weakness. And stop pretending. You know what? Us guys are notorious for this. We got to put on the bravo, bravo thing. We got to be the tough man or man or mind. But, but there are times when we got to say, hey, look, I didn't do well at this. I, I'm a failure at it. Forgive me. It's okay to ask your kids to forgive you. You know that? And the last thing he said is, I would pray differently for my children. I would pray, God, have them. God, I don't know what you're going to do with them, but Lord, whatever you're going to do, please, God, I give them to you, and I release them to you, and Lord, work it out. Help me to be the best father or mother so that this can happen. Amen. 
And instead of focusing on me, because our society is me, 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 right? So instead of focusing on me, focus on your children. Do more things with your children. Encourage and bestow more praise. You know what? I've heard about teachers who praised their children that were their students. And when the story is told back, that one teacher who praised and loved their students are the ones, that's the teacher that would make the big difference in somebody's life. Share God more intentionally with our family. Pay more attention. Are you ready for this one? Pay more attention to the little things, the deeds and words of love and kindness. I, I was thinking the other day. We have kids in our home who draw pictures, and even Dan draws me pictures of water towers. And, and I mean, these kids do these things and give you gifts if you accept them. And then share more intimately our relationship with God. And use every ordinary thing that happened in our life to point to how God loves us and how He cares for us. And if there's going to be music in your home, Dad, you're the leader of the band. Amen. You're the leader of the band. Take a spiritual stand. God has called you to be the leader of the band. Stand tall. Stand tall. Stand firm. Love and compassion go further than anything else. Flee from sinful living. Tell your story to all you can. Keep your story simple. I, I hear these guys, especially, especially coming out of a, a Bible college and seminary, throwing out the, the great large theology, theologic words, and, and, and sometimes we're throwing the Greek to impress people how much we know. Bottom line is, keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. We are simple people, amen? Amen. And then take the time to have an intimate relationship with God and pray with Him. I pray with Max every night. Tell a story, puts him to sleep, but tell him a story. Try to tell stories that will help draw him to Jesus. Plan on major changes in your life if you need to do that by next year to make this part major up. Make sure you're in a born-again relationship with the Lord. Seek a holy lifestyle. Plan on leading your family as a father. Invest in kingdom business and pay your... I was thinking about this. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, pay your tithes sounds like you're obligated to pay your dues. Teach your children that giving is a joyful thing. I don't give because I'm forced to give. I give because I find it a joyful thing. Thank you, Lord, for letting me give back to you and your kingdom. Come on, we, we, we encourage you online. Uh, some of you aren't attending regular church. If you're not tithing regularly, we, we don't want you to do it because we want your money. But I think... That, you need to invest in the kingdom and what you're receiving. I've never gone into a restaurant yet where they let me eat for free and I go across the street and pay McDonald's. <laughs> Have you? Mm -mm. And now they expect at least a 20% tip. We never tip God, do we? Because see, the Bible says we, we give him, sometimes we give him 10% of our income. Anything else we give to missions or some of these other things, that's above and beyond. That's our offering. So your tithes and your offering. That's cool, isn't it? Amen. So, so give. Give joyfully. When you put that, when you put your money into play, and if it's all your money that you had and you don't have any more, you try, think, thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. I'm giving this to you because I am a part of your family and do it with joy. I, I listen to some of these, uh, I don't know if you want to call them hucksters, but these, these name it and claim it rich guys that, that, that preach the gospel and they're multimillionaires, and I'm thinking, how can you be a multimillionaire if you're serving the Lord? Somebody say amen. amen. Now I'm not saying, now listen, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying God can't bless you, or God can't make you have have income, especially if you're not a pastor. But the bottom line is that we're investing in the kingdom, and we always give back to God out of our bountiful blessing from Him. Now, that was not in my notes, but it's there. If you're going to be a leader of your home, then you've got to teach your children the total walk with God, including stewardship of time. Time is as important as money, you know that. Of, of doing things for the kingdom. And as they see you do it, they'll want to keep doing the same thing you did. Amen? So we celebrate our fathers. Thank you, fathers out there online and everywhere else. 
If you're going to be successful, dads, you got to make sure you got a born-again relationship with your Creator and seek a holy lifestyle. Secondly, plan on leading your family. Third, invest in kingdom business. Fourth, live your life so that others will want to follow you to the heavenly gate. And I was thinking how my dad had, had built this reputation of, of integrity and trust. Folks, that's your reputation. And so when people came by, when my dad was gone, they still talked about my dad. Walk into Thompson's. And now today, of course, it's been 50 years since I lived there. And, and so they, they probably don't remember my dad, but those guys knew my dad well. The guy who brought the tools, snap-on dude, stopped by all the time. I used to walk through his truck and look at all those tools. Dad made an impression on these people. By the way, I want you to understand this. That was a man of integrity. He still didn't know Jesus at that time. 73 years of age, one day Jesus came and knocked on his door and he asked Jesus to come in. 73. Some of you out there, it's not too late. Give your heart and life to Jesus. You want to be a great father. Get your heart and life straightened up with Jesus and line that up and everything else will fall in place. Amen? Amen. Stand with me, would you please? I don't know where you are. Some of you may need to ask Jesus to come into your life. Maybe you need to ask God to guide you and give you wisdom in your journey. You have children or grandchildren or you haven't even been married yet, but you want to have God in your life, number one. Well, today's the day. If you're home, well, obviously you don't have a church to bow and kneel there right where you're at, somewhere find a place to kneel and say, Lord, forgive me for my sin if you need to be born again. Obviously, if you confess your sin, what? He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then seek the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible didn't say the Holy Spirit might come. The Bible said the Holy Spirit will come on you. And then you will be a witness. Follow after that. Be hungry for the Lord. Live joyfully, fathers. Happy Father's Day. Father, we bow before you today. We're in all, Lord, that broken and undone. You came to us. Then when we were least worthy, you called us to follow after you. We are amazed today. We ask, Lord, that you touch us, that you refresh us, that you keep us close to you. And Lord, bless us in the name of Jesus. And we'll be careful to give you honor and glory and praise. For those who pray, Lord, if they're asking for salvation, give them the knowledge that they prayed for. Take the burden of sin from them. For those who need to be holier and, and, and walk after everything that you designed for them to do, bless them and use them, Lord, and help them to hear your voice. Have your way in us. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. 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 Now may the God of peace pour his spirit on you. And for every father, that God would use them to make a difference in this messed up, broken world. Go with God, I love you. Next Sunday morning, 10.30 right now, uh, a.m. and also 9.30 Sunday school next week. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Amen. Amen.